Good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to uh, to have so big number of participants at the first uh, European Gymnastics Trampoline TC uh, webinar. Uh, you may know that uh, European Gymnastics started uh, some package of uh, autumn webinars uh, this, uh, this October and November and also Trampoline TC prepared several webinars for, for you. This is the first one we start uh, with uh, psychology. The next webinar will be dedicated uh, to some specific uh, topic, what is, uh, let's say, everything what you need to, to know about the twisting. And uh, the last one in December uh, will be uh, dedicated to a specific of trampoline, uh, the acquisition of uh, some double somersaults and uh, difficult element. Uh, how to learn, how to uh, how to uh, provide uh, the preparation, etc., etc. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Vladimir Zeman, uh, the TC president of the European Gymnastics. And um, for this webinar, uh, we have a very very special guest, and uh, this is the expert who is uh, Monica Mexia from Portugal. I think uh, many of you may know Monica from the past because she was a gymnast. Uh, she judged as well, and she was an excellent event organizer. Uh, you may remember her from, uh, for example, Lola Cup or uh, also from European Games, where she was uh, one of the key persons uh, helping with the organization. Uh, Monica stopped uh, the trampoline career a couple years ago and uh, started uh, the new direction. Uh, she developed a big, big uh, uh, participation in the psychology, what is uh, her uh, job uh, profession. And uh, she has also good experience uh, with the application of psychology uh, into the sport, uh, including uh, trampoline, double mini, and tumbling. Monica, welcome, and uh, it's your floor now. <laughs> thank you very much, Vladimir. And thank you, and first and foremost, thank you for the TC uh, of UEG for for inviting me, and and the immense honor of being the first in this uh, autumn and winter webinars for, for UEG. So it's, it's really a great honor to, to start this adventure with UEG and, and, and to combine my two passions, uh, which is uh, psychology and uh, gymnastics. So it's, it's truly an amazing honor to, to be with you um, this morning um, and to share a bit of my ideas of um, mental health and mental preparation uh, for competition in trampling DMT and tumbling. Um, we, we were talking previously uh, in, before we started the webinar that preparing mentally for a webinar is not so different from preparing uh, for, a, for a competition. It has some points in common, has some differences. My goal today is to give you some practical strategies to, to, to work with your competitors if they are very small or if they are, or if they are already seniors and, and elites. So we can adjust, adjust to different ages and different contexts uh, with small alerts that I will give you. Uh, I'm, not a small, I'm not a sports psychologist, I'm a clinical psychologist who has a, a very deep background in, in sports. So my view of uh, psychology and mental preparation is a bit different sometimes from sports psychologists and some approaches that I have with some, some competitors and some athletes are a bit different because they are based on clinical and mostly on the brain and how the brain works these things out and how can we use our brain to help us and not sometimes play tricks on us in, in mental preparation. Um, and because I had both sides of the, 
of, of the picture. So as a competitor, I felt it. I felt the difficulties of mental preparation. Um, as an organizer, I saw a lot of things happening. And as a psychologist, I have the knowledge, the technical knowledge behind it. So basically, I went through all the system before really starting into this. I've, I've been a psychologist for almost 20 years, so I've seen a lot. Um, so again, I want to welcome you all to this small chat that we're going to have for the next hour or so. Um, and please feel free to ask any questions on the Q&A box and we'll talk about it in the end. Okay. So the challenge was to talk about strategies, implications and complications in the mental preparation for competition with application to trampling, DMT and tumbling. And there are some differences because for us, especially in gymnastics, we know that a trampoline routine, although for the commoner takes an instant, for us, a trampoline routine takes a lot of time, other than DMT that's really fast and really explosive and tumbling that looks a bit longer, but at the same time, it's really, really speedy. So we need to understand that the way we prepare ourselves and the way we prepare our competitors can be a bit different sometimes and the challenges that they have also are different. So about me, well, Vladimir did the favor of um, resuming my resume, so save this, this slide, but um, it's been a long road in trying to understand how to better prepare competitors, and I have quite a few as clients, um, and it is something that we work on a lot. Uh, not only when we take trauma out of the picture, but then to pre better prepare them for in the future, they don't need me anymore. Um, but it's really important to think about what's happening in the person's brain when they're preparing for a competition and when they're training. So I always like to give you this. And I know that, okay, we're not in a neurology webinar, but it's really important for us to, to say that when we ask the competitor to think they're using one part of the brain when they're when we're asking them to feel it's a completely different part of the brain and when they're competing they're competing or when they're jumping on the way they're performing their exercises another part of the brain gets activated and if we ask the brain to activate too many parts of, at the same time they could they compete within each other so to ask an athlete to activate the automatism to perform a double, a double somersault and ask them at the same time to think about it, we're just giving the wrong cue. Because at the same time, thinking will interrupt the, autom the, autom the automatism that lives in the limbic lobe. Okay, so it's really important for us to start deconstructing all of this and start seeing gymnastics as well from what's happening in the brain. Because sometimes what we cue. The, the, the indication that we give in practice and in competition sometimes makes more confusion in the brain than more clarification. Okay, so this is an idea for maybe another webinar, Vladimir. Thank you. <laughs> just, just, just suggesting. Yeah. So about mental preparation. One thing that when I started preparing this webinar, I started thinking, okay, mental preparation in a very strange year like 2020. We're dealing with a lot of uncertainty right now. And, and competitors are, are dealing with a lot of uncertainty right now. We just had the Olympic Games postponed. Uh, a lot of uncertainty in terms of European championships, world championships, world cups, even domestic competitions. So right now for them preparing mentally for competition is dealing with uncertainty even more than before 2020 where a competitor always lives with uncertainty with uncertainty am i going to perform am i going to get injured am i going to achieve goals to get into the national team are my parents going to be upset with me because i have not good grades so i won't be able to train anymore so uncertainty is a part of us but right now we're dealing it with it a lot and that's the first thing we need to address when we go back to our gyms if we are in a country where we can train right now because we know that a lot of them 
cannot go to gyms right now, so we have to be creative. So to deal with uncertainty is to deal that. We can't control everything that's going on right now. And we need to talk about this with our competitors because it's a reality for them. And even though they're saying, oh, it's okay, we understand, it's there in the back of their head. So it's really important for us to start putting these things out. So it's good for us, each and every one, to think, what's our biggest struggle right now? In terms of thinking of the future, in terms of dealing with uncertainty. And at least one third of, of, of responses were uncertainty. Will, will competitions, competitions get canceled? Will gyms stay in business? Will we end up back on Zoom training God knows how? Will my athletes train hard just for nothing? So that's, and that will activate a lot of emotional responses on us, the coaches, the competitors, the families, and we all have to deal with it. No one knows when will this end, how will this end, and when especially. So uncertainty isn't new, right? We deal with uncertainty every day of our lives since we were born to the day we died. Now it's just more in our faces. And one thing that's three, three truths that we need to address is how to stay motivated right now. And that's a real honest challenge because especially in countries that are already in lockdown, how do we continue to stay motivated when we can't go to the gym? Coaches can play a really important role in this, but to provide um, motivation and, and goals. Oh, but we don't know if we're going to, to reach them. It doesn't matter. Right now we need objectives. We need things that keep us going. Freezing up and freezing up can be a hard truth. Our brain has a defense mechanism. We call it fight or flight. But it always, can, it always has as well freezing and fainting. So it's the survival mechanism that we've inherited since we are reptiles um, and that kept us alive for all these years. So freezing up is like when the brain gets caught in the situation where they can't decide what to do, so they freeze. And we see this a lot in, in practice and we see this a lot in competitions as well. Okay, so it's really, um, it's really important for us to start thinking that freezing up is not sometimes not caring, but simply the brain trying to specifically struggle with what's going on. I can't deal with this uncertainty right now. And we can train this in practice, just as we train a somersault or a straddle or a flick or a whip or whatever. Okay. The more uncertainty the brain has to deal with, the more the tendency to freeze up. Okay? So it's really important that you, you, we tell our brains enough information for it not to freeze up. And this help ha happens a lot in preparation of competition when we don't tell our competitors what's going on, what's, what, what's going to happen next. Especially, for example, when there are newcomers in competition, it's the first time in European Championships, for example. And we don't tell them step by step what are the procedures. And but then, then they end up there and there's not enough information and the brain just freezes. Okay, so information is important in terms of mental preparation. And finding gratitude, well, we should find gratitude in every part of our lives, not in just preparation for competition, but always thinking and especially the most competitive athletes always see the cup half empty and never half full. It's always what, what I didn't get, what I didn't do. Did I point my toes? Yeah, but what did you do that was good? Okay. Can you be grateful to yourself that you did it? So it's always to put it in the positive way. Besides, of course, cueing what needs to be improved. Okay, so three, we have three truths that help us navigate uncertainty. There's always uncertainty in life, and there's always, there will always be in everything, not only in sports. There are so many things that we cannot control. Right now, we can't control the virus. We can't control what's going on. We can't control everything that happens in a competition. We can't control 
the marks the judges are gonna are gonna do we can't control if it's a bit warmer or a bit colder we can't control a lot of things and to admit it and to be able to talk about it helps our brain and the pain is inevitable and there's always a bit of controversy with the pain is inevitable <laughs> it's not physical pain although there is some amount of it in gymnastics but pain is inevitable in terms of there's always activation, there's always anxiety, there's always feelings coming up. So pain is inevitable. We always say that suffering is optional, but we'll get to that. So to have this, the uncertainty quadrant, and this is very interesting because that gives us a full view of basically four types of competitors that we'll have and that we'll, we'll need to work on um in terms of preparation okay so we can have the panicked and underprepared so think of it this way something's happening in a competition they're, they're really panicked and they're underprepared so they didn't train enough they're in, they didn't invest enough in in a certain skill or a certain routine and they're panicking so they're freaking out and those the, this is what we don't want Okay, so to have a competitor come up into a competition where he can, he's panicking, and if he's panicking, always be alert that there could be a disorder there, an anxiety disorder that's probably been happening for a long time, and we just keep ignoring it. Okay, and most people that go into panic mode need professional help. Okay, it will save you all a lot of trouble. And they're underprepared because they didn't invest enough in their sometimes physical preparation, sometimes their mental preparation. So the ends are just just staring at the trampoline or, or or the tumbling track, and they do nothing. Basically, they just freeze most of the time. We can have we can be panicked and overprepared. So we're still panicking, but we trained a lot, but still totally panicking. And that will basically give us a freaking out attitude. And, and we see this a lot in very activated um, athletes. They trained a lot, but when they get to the point of, even not even reaching the competition, but like the week before, they're already freaking out. So they're overprepared because they trained a lot, but they're still panicking. So there's an emotional state here that's activating and that it's activating the limbic lobe and they can't think. So those are the ones that we need to worry a lot. We can be underprepared for calm. So imagine, I always give this example, you are sitting in your gym and the gym's burning up and you're doing nothing, you're just sitting and thinking, oh, the fireman will arrive eventually, but I'll do nothing. I won't leave, I won't reach an extension, I'm just there. So you're calm, but you're not doing anything about it. We see this in competitions where the athlete just sits there, doesn't start warming up, doesn't start mentally preparing, doesn't start using his imagery, is that just there waiting for someone to tell him what to do. So he's calm, but really underprepared. He's responsible, but doesn't do anything but that. And we reach the, the sweet spot. It's overprepared and calm. And that's where we want our athletes to be. They're ready. They've done the work all year in all the practices to reach to a competition in an optimal state. Overprepared and calm, you're dealing with uncertainty in the most healthy way, and that's what we want. But to get to that point, all preseason and all season, competitive season, must be a constant mental training as, as long as physical training goes on as well. So what we, can we do to prepare? Well, three questions that we need to start asking our, our athletes in training a lot. What, it, what are you worried about right now? And he says, I'm worried that I trained a lot during pre-season and then all my competitions will be canceled. Okay, next question. What, what is within your control? 
what can you control? If the meets get canceled, if the competitions don't exist this year, we can always show up to practice and continue to improve. So that's what we can control. So that's where we focus. Oh, but maybe, no maybe, this is what we can control. So direct, we direct their focus to whatever they can control. Oh, but if I go into competition and the others do more difficult routines or whatever, what can you control? So always redirect every speech to what the person can control. And what can I do to better prepare for this? Can I train harder? Can I train less? Because some kids overtrain. What can, what can I do? What is in my power to better prepare for this situation? Do I need help to manage my anxiety? Can I eat more healthy? What? And this will provide you a mental status to create a plan with your competitor to what he needs specifically, he or she needs specifically. So it's really important to work this out with them, not for them. Like I said, there are many things we can't control. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. So pain is inevitable to every competitor, competitor in every sport. But to be caught in that pain and to be suffering for that, that's optional. In that, we can do something about it. So we can do, we go into, I can do this mode. I can do this. And it's something that we hear a lot in different languages, of course. Um, in our competitors, I can do this. We can do this. It's a little of the, yes, we can. So, but how can you reach I can do this. Well, we have a thing or two that can help us. So think of it as six ways of helping ourselves. Self-efficacy, it, it's to become more efficient, basically. We have verbal persuasion. And it's really what Bandura, a very known psychologist, always said it really depends on the inner speech that we have with ourselves the type of language that we use with ourselves i can do this you can do this i've got this um let's go something i always say before i start a, a webinar let's do this so verbal persuasion the inner chat we have with ourselves it makes a world of difference especially the choice of words and we can train this every day especially when they're very young. If we just create a routine of verbal persuasion, it helps a lot. Again, if the emotional activation of the competitor in practice is too high and it's something that they can't manage, it's best just to send them to a mental health professional, a psychologist in some countries, um, social workers do this as well, and to work on managing their emotions better because that will can get in the way of verbal persuasion. So in self-persuasion, we can actively just create a mindset for that. I can do this. I can go on the trampoline and do this. On the DMT, before they start running, it's so important for them to have good verbal persuasion to themselves, good self-persuasion. I've got this. I can explode on this. I can land this routine. Not he did very well, it's what I can do. So it's, again, dealing with uncertainty. Past performances are a huge one, and, and we always work on this. Okay, I can do with it. I proved it, I've done it before. Can I recall a time where I did this previously? Can I tap into the emotions and the body sensations that I felt when I had those past performances? Can I hold on to them? Can I feel them? Good. Can I access them? Okay, just keep it there. Now go. Okay, so it's really important that we, all, we accumulate and we then pick up on those past performances. Um, so we can become totally fearless. Vicarious experiences. Well, this one can be a tricky one, but 
think of it this way. For some competitors to see someone from their club or even other clubs or national teams to do things, the mental instruction to themselves will be, okay, if she can do this, then I can do it as well. Just be careful because some kids and some athletes will do it the other way around. Oh, if she can do this, then I can't. Then you will have to go back to verbal persuasion and past performances. Okay. How do we know that a competitor will do this, will do it one way or the other? We need to know them. Okay. So this won't work the same way for every competitor. It will be different. So we need to know our competitors so we can start figuring out what works with each one of them. So it's really important for us to gain a habit from a very young age of talking to people about these things. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Okay, because if vicarious exper experiences can work for them, then we can use that. But we can't use that with everyone because with some competitors, it will work in a very bad way. So make sure you're always look using the bright side of things. Okay, because if it doesn't work with a competitor, don't force it. Okay, because you, you can create trauma from that. Emotional state, and I've been talking a lot about emotions. So if a competitor can regulate their emotions and, and in practice, it's really important for us to practice. What are you feeling? It's like a question we need to ask at least once every practice. What are you feeling? How are you feeling today? How are you feeling when you're doing that new routine? Because those are the things that then in competition, when we change the competition mode, it's there, it's practice, it's done, it's in the brain in competition, we just need to perform, okay? So that's why we practice so much mental state and practice and not in competition. Physiological state, of course, that's going to affect everything. If my heart is pounding, if I have sweaty hands, if I don't feel good, if I have a bad back, if I have a stomach ache, of course it's going to interrupt everything. It's going to harm everything. And again, if kids or if athletes in general start over feeling everything or sometimes under feeling everything, like what do you feel? Nothing. How does a person feel nothing before a world championship? You're not supposed to. You're supposed to feel something. So. Picture a window of tolerance. Everything in terms of emotional state, if it goes below a certain level or, or above a certain level, you need to sit down and have an honest chat with your competitor because something's up. And sometimes it might not be related um, to gymnastics, to trampoline, and to tumbling, but it's there and it's preventing optimal emotional state for the competitor to perform. And we have imagery. And imagery, we train this a lot in gymnastics, and I always put this here, but it's a must. It's probably done in, throughout the world. Some, some people um, call it visual, visual, visualization. We normally call it just imagery. Okay, so most coaches use it. But it's really important uh, to use it correctly and to make sure that they're doing it in the correct way. Uh, we see it a lot, for example, in trampoline. They're doing imagery faster than they, than they perform it. So imagery must be as close to the real deal as possible. And it's really important to assess in training. When they're doing the imagery, is, is the skill correct? And how are they feeling when they're doing it? Because sometimes they're just doing imagery, but they're not doing it correctly. The skill is not correct, or they can't see themselves. Okay, so work a bit more on your imagery because sometimes, especially when they're younger, they say that, oh yes, I'm doing it, but they're not doing it exactly correct. So spend some time working on imagery with your, with your competitors because it works, it, it works like wonders. So, 
having a trust mindset for competition. Well, I normally say that we have two different mindsets, training mindset and trusting mindset. And training mindset is basically the base of trusting mindset. So that's where we need to focus. Because if we do training mindset correctly, when we switch to trusting mindset, everything should go smoothly. Conscious thought. Well, coaches will probably give you give competitors a lot of corrections, and we know that gymnastics that happens a lot in DMT, in tumbling, in in, in trampling, it's transversal to, to everything. There's a lot of details. It's it's a very specific um, sport and specialties. So there's always a lot of corrections. Those corrections and that conscious thinking that we train our competitors should only happen in training. Now I've seen in situations, and that's a wonder of having so many years of, of gymnastics on the other side, on the judging and on the, on the organizing competitions. Now we see a lot of coaches still doing corrections in competitions. It just takes, it, it takes them out of the mindset that we want and just it takes, it takes them back to the training mindset. We don't want that. Conscious thought is what we ask for competitors, for athletes to have in training. That's when they need to listen to the details and to correct them in their imagery. So it's really important for, for us to start teaching our athletes that training mindset is one thing. Trusting or competition mindset is a completely different thing. We can train competition mindset in training but we can't do it the other way around. So conscious thought is, okay, I need to put my arm this way or my head this way in training, but never in competition. Because if not, it will interrupt the automatism that we want to connect. Repetition, and repetition is always a Bible in gymnastics. We repeat, we repeat, 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 repeat endlessly things. And it's, it's really funny because when I work with young athletes, I always ask them, why do we do so many repetitions in gymnastics? And where they're really young, they say, because it's boring. And I always ask them that, no, it's so you don't have to think about it when you're doing it in competition. It creates a routine in our brain. And when we get there, we just, it happens. We don't think about that while we're doing it, right. That's why I do repetitions. But it's important for us in the training mindset to explain to kids, why do we repeat things so much? Why do we insist so much in arms in this position, body in that position, running in a certain way? Why do DMT or tumbling runners run so much? They train running and it's not even a thing the judges are looking at. It's important for them to understand the whys, especially when they're starting out. Because sometimes, if they don't understand why, they don't invest as much energy in it. And it saves us a lot of trouble. And devaluation. And you can say, why are we talking about evaluation in training if they get evaluated in competition? Different type of evaluation. Evaluation is watching it on video. And more and more, we have recording and cameras on our training so kids can watch what they're doing after they're doing it, and it's fine. You just don't make a show out of it. I've seen it sometimes, people just running and watching, and when it's a big fall and kids start laughing and all of that, nah, no. It's just an evaluation, okay? It's not a show. So we can better adjust reg emotional regulation when things don't go um, as well in training. But it's really important to have them used to being evaluated in video or by the coach's cues, or, and at the same time, not to overthink what's being analyzed. So sometimes they get stuck. If you say, for example, your arm needs to go a bit higher, and they get stuck in that cue for a long time, okay? Some kids, especially the most perfectionists, tend to overanalyze what's being said. So really be watchful for that because 
that way they'll only concentrate on that cue and forget everything else. Okay, so be careful if they just try frowning their eyebrow, eyebrows or just looking very straight at you or thinking about it too much. You say, no, 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 no. Just keep that in mind what I told you and let's do this. Okay, because if not, they'll get stuck in the moment. So these are the three main things I want you to, to think about in the training mindset. Some people ask me, well, do I think we need to train competitions in training? Yes. Why? To better deal with uncertainty, which was what we talked about in the beginning. So it's really important to have a routine of internal competitions, fake competitions, whatever competitions, and to help them switch from training mindset to trusting mindset or comp competition mindset, like I like to call it sometimes. Because when we go into competition mindset, well, it's let it happen. I was working with a, with a trampolinist a uh, few weeks back and, and I, I thought of him when I, when I was preparing this and I was working with him and, and all of a sudden when we got to the let it happen, he said, it's a bit like let it go, right? And he started singing the Frozen song and we, yeah. And so from then on, his verbal shift cue was singing let it go. It worked with him. So it was a bit strange on his playlist to have frozen songs, but it worked. And it, it is let it happen. From the point of reaching the competition floor, um, it's just let it happen. There are no adjustments to be made. There's nothing. The work is done. Just let it rip. The automatism should be created by then. And it's done. Now it's just flip into, into competition mode and jump or run or perform. Okay, so we don't complicate things that are simple from that, from that point on. We throw away our doubts. I did the work, I trained. So there are no what ifs. What if I fail? What if the judges don't score me high enough? Poor judges, because the judges are thinking, what if I don't judge low enough? And then Vladimir will probably be telling them, are your scores correct? Something like that. So no what ifs, okay? We just let it happen. So a lot of them will go back to the first one, just let it happen. There's no point in making scenarios at that point. So if, if they start coming to you as a coach or as a delegate, well, what if, what if I do this? What if my, what if I don't score high enough? It doesn't matter right now. Just do it. Okay, just let it happen. So just cut their speech and their line of thought and don't let them go into the what if scenarios because there's like infinite what ifs. Just fo refocus them on what are we doing right now? What can we control? What can we do to control it? What we can control is how we do our warm up, how we do our routines, where did we, where did we leave our leotard? That we can control. What? It's what we can do right now. Never the what ifs, okay? A visual shift. For some athletes, this is really, really, really helpful to have something visual, like to stop before they go into the sports center and watch the doors or watch the locker, or to have something on their phone and on their wallet that when you, they look at it, they go into competition mode. I, I remember a competitor he was a, a tennis player that I worked with a couple of years ago that his visual shift was a medal that he won on his first competition. That was his visual shift. Every time he looked on that medal, his brain went in competition mode. So it's really important for us to work with our athletes and find out what, what visual shift works for them and train them with that. And it's the same with, ver uh, with verbal shifts. I have, let's do this, always have, since I was a competitor. So every time I 
go into a session with a client, let's do this. So we have the Nike just do it thing. Okay, so it's important for us to find what works with each person and have that person tell that, tell themselves internally or verbally their verbal shifts. For some athletes, it's amazing how the wardrobe shift works. So every time they take off their training clothes and put on their competition clothes, it's sometimes even his, his or her face changes. We need to train that as well. So it's really important when we do those training competitions to use the wardrobe of competition so they get them in competition mode. To have a mantra, and yeah, it sounds a little off, but it helps with some, some of them. And it really comes to the verbal shift as, as, as well, but sometimes it's a bit more complex and with some competitors really words to have a mantra. It's their mantra. It, it can't be someone gave them the mantra. It's something that they build. As coaches, we just need to help them build them sometimes, what works for them. So the mantra, they keep mantraing it until they go into competition. Or, and it helps a lot, between routines. Just to keep them in the emotional state that we want for the next routine. And in competitions, that can take a while. Because sometimes between the first routine and the second routine, it, for judges, it takes a minute. For coaches, it takes half a minute. For a competitor, it looks like three hours. Especially if they're a bit anxious. So to have a mantra just keeps them going. And sometimes they even record it and they're just listening in their headphones between routines. So it's a strategy. To have a plan, and isn't all of this that we're talking about a plan? Yeah, but sometimes we really get stuck and overthinking and having really complex, complex thoughts. And again, between routines and during warm up, this happens a lot. So it's really hard to just enjoy our performance and just to let it happen, again, number one. Um, we need to work on a plan before we go into competitions. Everything we've been talking about adapts to every competitor is that plan. And sometimes when we start seeing kids get stuck and overthinking, we just need to remind them of the plan. What, were we, what did, we, did we train in terms of preparing and dealing with competition? Oh, we did this, 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 this. Did this work previously? Yes. Can we control this? Yes. Then let's execute. So it's really important to have to each of your competitors to have that plan that works for them. Okay. The next one is my favorite, having fun. And yeah, when they're elites and world champions, are they still having fun? They're supposed to. So it's really important to have fun. And, and, and when we say have fun, it's not fooling around, it's having fun. It's enjoying what they're doing. It's to have that wonderful sensation of, of speed and, and lightness that we have in the air or just explosion on the tumbling track. And we need sometimes to remind them that they're supposed to have fun as well. Besides winning, besides being professionals, besides being Olympians, they're supposed to have fun. And every time a competitor stops having fun, they're in trouble. Okay, and we see this so many times, kids go into competition and they look like they're having a limb just ripped out of their body. They're not having fun. And we need to understand why and help them with that. So just be watchful of that. Yes, competi competition is a very serious thing, but there has to be some enjoyment in it. If not, it's not worth it. And let go of mistakes. And this is so unfair in, 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 our, in trampling in DMT and tumbling. If, if we think of, for example, in what, uh, world and artistic gymnastics, they fall down, they can 
resume their routine. And trampoline, they fall down, it's over. And DMT, if they do a bad mount, it's over. And tumbling is the same. So it's a very unfair sport in that matter. So letting go of mistakes from the first routine to the second routine, sometimes it's a huge challenge because they'll ask themselves, what for? Why should I continue? And they start just getting stuck in that thinking process. But we practice for this. So the next routine should be a good base to improve on that, to prove ourselves that we can pass over adversity. So we need to do it just like we did it in practice. So to let go of our mistakes, it's something that we really need to do in practice. So they're used to reaching competition, not having a great first routine, and sometimes not even a miss, just small failure, a lower score than, than they anticipated. And they need to let go of that mistake, reset their brain, giving it a good mantra or good verbal or visual shift and continue to the next. And that should be trained all the time. Okay, so it's really important, in, even in practice, they start training something and it's not so good. We need to make sure that what's going on from the first time they go into the tumbling track to the second time they go into a tumbling track to train exactly the same thing. So they learn how to let go of the mistake before and they just focus on the cue that the coach gave them. Okay, and we need to talk to them about that. So achieving, and this is basically like a resume. We need to use our imagery. We need to remember this. What got you prepared? How, do we get, how did we get there? What tricks worked? What didn't work? For some competitors, making lists helps. Careful with the, most, the more obsessive ones because they'll make too many lists, too big, too unattainable. Those are, again, the one that might need professional help to surpass that obsessive behavior. Different focusing styles. And, and we need to understand that each and every one of us focuses on a different way. So it's not one thing fits all. It's really finding what fits each competitor. So don't find a formula and try to fit everyone in it. Okay, we really need to know our athletes so we can fit all of this that I'm telling you in much more than exists into that person and help them just cement that in their brain. So when needed, it just happens. Find patterns. Gymnasts and athletes in general are very ritualized. So they learn to do things in a very strict way and they always do it in the same way it's almost like a ritual but sometimes they forget to find patterns in what happens so for example if i had a really bad sleep last night and i was up a bit later than i was supposed to and then i didn't eat correctly or didn't or didn't drink enough water i felt a bit more off that day and maybe competition didn't go so well and every time this happens, competition doesn't go so well. So it's finding these patterns. But when I do my mental routines and my imagery right, things go better. And sometimes we need to stop them and to help them find those patterns that are going to help them in the future. Remember a poor perform performance. It's basically remember a time when we blew it, when we did not our best. We did not maintain our focus. We did not what we had set out to do. Again, go through all these questions, all of that above. What did we do the week before, the day before, the moment before, and correct it? It's not let it go, don't think about it. No, 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 no. Let's take a moment and think about it so we can correct it. We don't run away and put away bad things just because they're bad. Okay, we learn from it. Okay. The only thing we learn from victories is to celebrate. 
the only thing we lose from learn from not so good things is how to correct them. So don't run away from poor performances. So basically, remember our goals. Teach how your athletes how to breathe because I keep seeing them in competition breathing from here instead of from down here. Okay, and if you breathe a lot from here, we'll become more anxious. So teach them how to breathe. Use cues, triggers, and focal points. Learn how to reset between routines. Getting back in the moment, and that's so important. It's what can I control right now? What can I do right now? Create your routine and practice your strategy. So mental preparation is done in practice just like any other skill, okay? And that's it. If we put all of this in practice, then we should have much better prepared athletes than we now have. So it's Q&A time, I think. Vladimir, do you have something for Q&As? Anyway, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, anyway, uh, I would have uh, some small question. Uh, what uh, would you uh, recommend to uh, to the coaches uh, working with small kids? Start practicing all of this from day one. If we if we do this from day one with small kids, if we really teach them how to talk about what they're thinking and what they're feeling and giving them proper feedback, the probability of them having anxiety issues and performance issues further on are much less. So most athletes are people pleasers. So they'll, they'll, they'll do anything to please their coaches because especially when they're very small, they just want to please their coaches. They, they want to see their coaches happy. So every time a coach says, are you nervous? No. Are you feeling good? Yeah. Even if they're not. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. But when they go back on the trampoline, that nothing happens. So most athletes are really people pleasers, especially coaches pleasers. So we need to start reaching for them. I said, mm, I don't think, what I'm feeling right here is that you're a bit nervous. Mm, okay, let's talk about that. You know, when I was a kid, I was nervous as well. Sometimes when you go up on, on the tumbling track, I'm nervous as well. So it's okay to be nervous. So if we just start talking about things in a very normal way, kids won't be so coaches pleasers. Okay. And that should be started working on from day one, from day zero. It's as important of having to do a decent somersault. Okay, Monica, we have some questions and sure. questions uh, part. Okay, is there a good way to lay out your training journal to help promote good self-talk? Oh, training journal journals. Yeah, it helps. With some kids, it helps. Um, I've seen it done with words. I've seen it done with um, drawings with smaller kids, uh, training journals not only um, in terms of the routines, so not only technical training journals, but emotional training journals, uh, because sometimes it will help them to create that pattern that I was talking about. Um, so it's really interesting for them to do a training journal of what they're thinking and what they're feeling. It will help them to be more self-aware and will help the coaches as well if they manage to talk about it to help them, okay, this, this could be a possible situation we need to solve. This is, okay, we're not supposed to attach this thought to this skill. So yeah, um, an emotional and thinking um, training journal should be really good for self-talk. Some kids will resist because, oh, there I go writing about my thoughts. But when they get into it and when they see the purpose in it, it helps a lot. So Lotte is asking, what can you do as a coach when your gymnast is freezing because of fear? Oh, tricky one. Um, 
if it's happening in the beginning, it, it really depends on the age of the gymnast as well. But if it happens in the beginning, they're starting to freeze up, just take them off the trampoline or the DMT or the tumbling track and start, why are you freezing up? I'm afraid of what? Please do not go the, you, you, there's no reason to be afraid. There is, they're doing crazy things in the air. There is reason to be afraid. But again, we can think of so many times they've done it without getting hurt. There's that possibility, but the first th thing a gymnast learns is how to fall. Um, so we can try and rationalize it with your gymnast, but if it's a pattern of behavior, that freeze response because of fear might not even be attached to the skill in question, but to fear of failing, not meeting um, people's expectances. Um, and sometimes it can be family related, school related, not necessarily competition or sports related. So if it really starts happening as a pattern, I would recommend an intervention from a professional, okay? Because it's just the brain just boycotting uh, what's going on and saying, okay, you, you might not do this well, so let's not do this at all. And sometimes it happens in areas of the brain where they can't, they can't control it. Because so it's, it needs external intervention, but it, it always needs to be analyzed. What kinds of behavior should I absolutely avoid as a judge? <laughs> oh, Frank. Um, <laughs> well, the president of TC is here, so. Um, <laughs> um, well, as judges, and, and I've been in that situation, we're, we're trained to do a poker straight face. Um, and we should maintain it. Because especially when we're judging uh, kids, small kids, um, they're really scared of the judges. One thing I've, I developed when I, when I was a judge, and especially when I was chair and, um, and, and judging small kids, in the end, I would smile. It really helps because absolutely avoid any kind of laugh. For example, the more paranoid competitors will take them as they're making fun of me. Um, so we forget sometimes that they're watching us. They're looking at us. So anything that can be misinterpreted in terms of facial and body expressions should be avoided. We really need to be aware of ourselves as judges because they're watching and, and in our mind, we're just laughing at what our colleagues said, but they don't know that. So they can misinterpret a lot. So we really need to be aware of that. Oh, Luis is writing for me in Portugal, in Portuguese. Um, Imagetic is not easy. There's a, there's a way of training with the younger one. Um, I don't know if this is a question or a statement, uh, but yeah, imagery sometimes is not easy and there are interesting ways. Uh, using v visual support sometimes helps. Coaching, coaching them almost like um, slow and very descriptive way of hypnosis not being clinical of no hypnosis, for example, uh, helps. Um, sometimes if they just can picture the skill very slowly in the beginning, it helps. But video should help a lot in beginning the process. Okay. It's another webinar we can do, Vladimir. Thank you. Oh, slow imagery. <laughs> Gymnasts' mental preparation pre-COVID may be different to post-COVID as there could be a gap of two years before they, they do competition. How would you suggest us coaching approaching the new needs of our gymnasts as the anxiety will probably be greater for the first competition? It will be huge, Gary, and thank you for that question. Um, the whole world will change, change post-COVID and competition will be not different. We are still studying right now in terms of the psychology uh, community of the impacts and consequences that post-COVID will do in our mental health. And yes, we are expected to have higher degrees of anxiety um, 
in the first competition, not even the first competition, but through all the first season post COVID. Um, so we need to start working on that right now. Okay. Uh, to manage anxiety and to manage stress and to manage um, objectives right now. While, co while COVID, we're not even talking about pre-COVID, while COVID um, will prevent a lot of anxiety problems post-COVID. And don't be afraid as coaches to talk about it, to just put it out. Okay, look, I don't even know when, what, what's going to happen as well as a coach. Um, you could say to, to your competitors, but really lay it out and just start assessing, assessing what are the mental status right now of your competitors, because some of them will be really cool about it. And some of them will already be suffering from anxiety and the competition is not even in the foreseeable future. Okay. So first of all, assess what's going on with your, with your competitors. Okay. And then we'll, we'll need to just adjust, adjust all the mental preparation according to each competitor. Okay. And if you have any problems with that, just, Send me an email, send me text, send me a WhatsApp and whatever, and I can help you out thinking of what can be suited in each case, okay? Because it's a world of possibilities. Oh, you said it's a question, so I answered. Katerina is asking, what if during image your gymnast says she isn't capable of imaging the skill right and she sees herself, for example, falling or not having straight legs? Should we stop doing imagery altogether or how to help her? That's a great question. Um, yeah, a lot of the problems is that, that the imagery that's being caught up, that's being brought up, is not of the proper skill. Two things. First, we, can, we need to assess with the, with, with the gymnast if they are aware that it's not correct. Sometimes they're not even aware of that. So when they start telling us back verbally, what are the imagery, what is the imagery and what are they picturing? Sometimes we'll go like, that's not right. And sometimes they're doing it. And we do, they, when they do it in video, it's like, yeah, that's what I imagine. That's not right. And sometimes they're not even aware of that. So awareness should be the first step. If they imagine themselves falling, um, First, assess if their emotional state, emotional relation to the skill is correct. Are they afraid of doing the skill? Are they blocked doing the skill? Is it lost syndrome settling in or not? Okay, so stop imagering that skill. Go back to breaking down the skill into small sections, working on it again. It could be a technical issue and then it's your business as a coach. If it's fear attached to it, then we should see what's going on. If it's the fear that we were talking about previously, if it's paralyzing fear, and then the imagery just gets stuck because of the fear, we have really simple things as mental health professionals to unblock that fear. If it goes on and on and on, we just stop imaging go back to technical things, see if we, can, if we can correct it, break down the imagery into those progressions, okay? And start figuring out where does it go wrong, okay? So if we see if we can technically correct it, if not, and if it's emotionally related, there might be need of an external intervention in terms of emotions. Okay, so that should answer both. Should we stop it, should we continue it, and how to help? Okay, okay, no more questions. I think I've done it all. So, if there is uh, no more question. Yeah, I think we are done. Could you please uh, switch to me again or? Oh, yes. 
Okay. You have the floor. And thank you for much, so much for the questions. They were very interesting. Okay. Like this. Technology. Technology always plays a trick on us. Yeah. Okay. So we had a question, questions and answers, and uh, now I would like uh, to, to make for you some uh, advertisement or marketing, let's say. Uh, what is uh, what is the uh, how to do it? So. Okay. Do you see the next webinars? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I would like to to make some some small marketing or advertising of uh, two next webinars. The first one uh, will be dedicated to twisting. It's uh, it will be provided by uh, the emeritus pro professor of computer simulation in sport at the uh, university in Lugboru, uh, Dr. Fred Yedan, who is uh, the expert also for FIG academies. That means uh, that might be a really interesting uh, presentation uh, for the coaches to, to get some, some uh, technical knowledge or uh, scientific knowledge about twisting. And uh, the last webinar this year uh, will be with Mike Kuhn, uh, who will present for trampoline uh, the skill acquisition uh, for uh, full and half out and uh, free one uh, pike uh, from really beginning until including the skills into the combinations and routines. Uh, that uh, that's it. That it. Now I need to. Uh -huh. Switch the last uh, last page, and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm really happy we had uh, so many participants today, and I hope we will meet us again in uh, next webinars. Thank you very much, and see you next time. Thank you very much, and thank you again for having me, Vladimir. Thank you for everyone for for attending. Um, I think someone was um, asking, uh, will these webinars be available to rewatch? Uh, they're being recorded. We're being recorded, right? Just now, I, I will press stop recording. <laughs> and if everything went well, uh, we will publish, uh, publish the uh, webinar on the U European Gymnastics uh, uh, website or, uh, or uh, media. Uh, but not yes, not uh, tomorrow. In <laughs> in more days, because we want to uh, we want to to have some time between the webinar and publishing of the of the video. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank and you bye very bye. much.